Your writing is only as good as its weakest parts, so don't let it stay that way. I have a childhood memory of sitting in the back of the car on a rainy day while our first family computer was being loaded into the trunk. That behemoth came with a binder full of CDs, including various games and productivity software. One of those discs held a then-incredible electronic encyclopedia, and I remember spending a long time on it, listening to musical instruments from around the world, watching historical footage, reading about outer space, and answering trivia questions. One feature that I remember not really understanding was a program that would generate trees based on fractals set to certain parameters. My little kid brain did not understand how to set those parameters, and so I ended up with a lot of weird scribbles instead of stately trees. It was, however, my first encounter with fractals, shapes that are formed by self-similar repetition at ever smaller scales. So the idea behind the fractal trees is that the trunk would split into two branches, and each branch would split into two more, and then each of those would split into two, and so on and so on. Or you could start with a triangle, grow triangles out of each side, grow more triangles out of each of those sides, and on to infinity. Of course, none of this really has much to do with anything, but I do think there is some value here for writers. In the same way that that digital encyclopedia could create trees by splitting branches into ever smaller branches, we can have confidence that the big picture of our writing will work when the smaller pieces are pulling their weight. So let's embark together on a journey through the wonderful universe that I just made up of rhetorical fractals. Whenever you write, it's important to remember that your piece will have a particular job to do. Works of fiction should tell compelling stories, persuasive essays should make convincing arguments, and resumes should showcase your employable skills and experience. There might be a whole range of possible good stories, but your fiction will always fail if it doesn't tell a story. And we've talked about this before, but I think one of the most important developments in a writer's growth is learning to think less about what your writing says and more about what your writing writing does. In fact, when I was a younger, overconfident writer, I once turned in a paper that I thought was full of finely crafted sentences and clever turns of phrase. I thought it was a work of art, and my teacher handed it back with barely a passing grade. Luckily, though, when my teacher did give my paper back, he took some time to explain that my low score was not an indictment of my skill as a writer, but it was a recognition that my writing did not do the job it was supposed to do. It turns out that pleased with itself commentary is not the same as thorough analysis. So your writing will ultimately fail or succeed depending on how well it lives up to its intended purpose. Unless you have a strong thesis or a clear understanding of some other goal, it's not going to matter what else you write. The piece is doomed from the start. Your writing is more likely to accomplish its larger purpose if its smaller pieces are doing their part too. In essence, this is the principle of rhetorical fractals. If writing works at its smallest levels, it will work at its biggest ones, and vice versa. When I was standing at the edge of writing a dissertation at the end of PhD school, I didn't really know how I was going to manage writing a 300-page discussion of my own research. Just sitting down and writing it seemed impossible. But then I remembered this principle. The big pieces will work out if the smaller pieces are working too. So I said to myself, I don't really know how to write something like a book, but I have gotten really good at writing long papers. So what if my dissertation were a series of long academic essays? If each of those essays worked out, then the dissertation would too. And that's exactly what I did. I figured out what steps I would need to take to accomplish my overall goal, and then wrote an essay that did each of those things. Because each smaller section was doing its job to support the overall goals of the project, I didn't have to worry about whether or not the dissertation as a whole would work out. Of course, you might not be writing a book-length project, but it's still helpful to think in sections. What are the points you want to make along the way, the plot developments that need to happen, or even the headings that you want to include on a resume or CV? Define your purpose and then outline your sections to support that purpose. If you do that, you'll be writing something that has the structure to succeed. For a short paper, sections and paragraphs might be the same thing, but for papers with longer sections, it's then time to consider the purpose of each paragraph. And we've talked about paragraphs before, so I won't weigh you down with all the details. Just go watch the paragraph video. We'll both be glad that you did. But the idea is that just like papers and sections, paragraphs have a role to play and a job to do. 
Unfortunately, though, that's something that seems to trip people up pretty commonly. I've seen loads of paragraphs that try to do more than one job, and also paragraphs that split the same job across multiple paragraphs. What we really want, though, are paragraphs that do one specific job and one job only. Think of your paragraphs like containers, units of writing that have some kind of integrity. It's not about writing some arbitrary number of sentences, it's about doing a specific job. So look at the purpose of each section, and then make sure that each paragraph is contributing to the purpose of the section that it's in. You might be explaining the relationship between two peer-reviewed sources, describing the feelings of a character as they look out over the city wall, or warning readers that there's a distinct risk of electrical shock at this stage of the process. Whatever that job is, make sure that it's supporting the purpose of the section, which will be, in turn, supporting the purpose of the piece as a whole. Ah, the sentence, the fundamental unit of writing. Most guides to writing, and especially guides to writing style, are often just collections of sentences that have unique structures or interesting logical twists. Now, I like a cool sentence as much as the next guy, but sentences aren't that useful in isolation. When we write, we rarely ever just write one sentence at a time, so I'm not sure why we spend so much time showcasing individual sentences in a vacuum. In fact, most of the best sentences probably aren't that memorable by themselves, but they do valuable work in the context of the paragraphs that they're in. Because it is, after all, and always, all about context. In fact, it's often the sentences that are most pleased with themselves and that call the most attention to themselves that are the best candidates for deletion. They're the sentences that forget that they're playing on a team and contributing to the purpose of a paragraph. So don't forget about rhetorical fractals and the role they play at the level of the sentence. For something like a research paper, you'll probably have a sentence that provides some kind of transition from whatever came before, connecting old ideas to new ones. Then you'll get an introduction to the source or information you want to discuss, and that supports the claim the paragraph is making. Then you'll get a sentence or two that explains how that source supports the claim and how it all connects to the larger purpose of the project. A paragraph like this will be doing its job because every sentence is doing an important job too. Every sentence has a reason to be here. And that brings us to words. Now the thing about words is that they generally have the same job to do, and that's to mean something. Words will most likely let you down when they don't mean what you mean for them to mean. So resist the urge to scavenge a thesaurus for words to substitute into your writing, because synonyms are words that have similar meanings, not exactly the same meaning. It's usually pretty obvious when somebody is doing thesaurus substitutions because they'll suddenly use a fancy word that doesn't actually mean what they're trying to say. So if you don't know what a word means exactly, well, then learn it and make sure that its meaning lines up with your intent. If not, no sweat, just find a different word. Another common way that words will let you down is if you're just using them to impress people. Again, consider your larger rhetorical goal. Is it to impress people or to do a good job? Words that are only meant to impress are distracting because they pull attention away from your actual purpose and put that attention squarely on you. The most common offender is probably the word plethora, and I'm just going to get this off my chest. I don't think the word plethora is ever the right word to use. It's like the first fancy word that people learn, and then they somehow think that they're the only ones who know it. I can't tell you the number of times plethora shows up in the first round of papers each semester, but I can tell you that I groan internally an equal number of times. Yes, plethora does mean a lot, but it also means I know fancy words and I'm pretty stinking smart, probably smarter than you. And is that really the message you're trying to send? If you're tempted to say yes, Try again, this time focusing on your actual rhetorical purpose. A lot does its job without fanfare. Plethora, however, calls attention to itself and distracts from the purpose of the sentence that it's in. And if we want our sentences to do their jobs, our words should probably be doing them too. So there you go, a tour of the universe of rhetorical fractals. Is that exactly the right way to describe this phenomenon? I don't know, but it's a fun and useful way to do it. The basic idea, though, is this. You want to make sure that your writing aligns with your purpose at every level, from the overarching goal to the individual words. And just to be clear, this is a principle that comes into play when you're planning or revising, not drafting. If you're writing, just write, and then you can go back and find those individual pieces, whether they're sections, words, or paragraphs that aren't doing their job very well, 
and make the adjustments you need to. If each part of your writing is informing the next level down and supporting the next level up, then you can have all of the confidence in the world that your piece will do the job that you want it to do. So put on your fractal glasses and get to work, and I'll see you again before you know it. Thank you.